The Department of Homeland Security faces a multitude of threats, cybersecurity risks, foreign terrorist influence, domestic violent extremism, and border security. 20 years after the department's creation, confronting those threats is crucial. Michael Chertoff is former secretary of DHS. He served in that position from 2005 to 2009. Currently, he's executive chairman of the Chertoff Group. Secretary Chertoff, welcome to the program. Good to be on, Mimi. So the Colonial Pipeline attack is just one example of cybersecurity threats that seem to be getting worse. How would you rate the current security of our networks and what is DHS doing to protect them? Well, I would say that the security is uneven. There are some enterprises that do a pretty good job of protecting themselves. Others, particularly small and medium enterprises, have more difficulty. Uh, President Biden has issued an executive order that came out in May that directs DHS and some of the other relevant agencies to first upgrade the work that's being done in securing for government contractors, and then more generally to model best practices and information about threats for society in general. So how much worse is the problem of cyber attacks now than when you led the department? Oh, it's incomparably worse. When I left the department, it was still a threat, but a rather remote threat. We weren't seeing uh, anything other than theft of money or impersonation of people in order to uh, have criminal groups get financial gain. But what's happened now is it's become a battleground for nation states. We've seen the Russians and the Chinese not only engage in espionage, but actually disrupt or damage networks of what they perceive as their opponents. And the Colonial Pipeline is one example of a ransomware attack on major critical infrastructure that has had a ripple effect in certain parts of the country. So do you think that DHS has sufficiently prioritized cybersecurity? I think DHS has prioritized it. I think the challenge has been that we have an evolving threat that many private enterprises are not yet invested sufficiently in cybersecurity, and also that we need to consider taking a more active defense on the part of the government, perhaps striking at some of those platforms that are being used by criminal groups or nation states to mount these cyber attacks. You know, there's a lot going on right now at the southern border. I, I won't ask you about specifics, but generally, do you think DHS is the best agency to deal with the flow, and some would say flood, of migrants at the border? Well, I think DHS, certainly in terms of patrolling and apprehending people, is the agency which has the capability. And But Health and Human Services also has a role to play, particularly when we deal with underage migrants. And some of the things we observed over the last several years suggest that HHS or Health and Human Services was not prepared to deal with an influx of people that needed to be housed in less uh, draconian facilities. So I do think this is, a, again, a team effort. You need to have DHS supported by other agencies. You know, there's an enormous amount of resources going towards security at the southern border. What do you recommend to current Secretary Mayorkas on how best to use those resources? Because it seems like a well, no-win situation. Well, I think Secretary Mayorkas and, and President Biden understand that one of the critical issues here is the push factor. What is causing people to leave where they are now and try to migrate to the U.S.? <clears throat> Sometimes it's a natural disaster. The pandemic is obviously having an effect. Economic downturns in parts of South America have an effect. And then, of course, you have some countries where the rule of law is not really functioning, where you have criminal groups that are very powerful and where you have undemocratic governments. And that is also, also causing people to leave. So the best thing we can do strategically is to try to do our best to mitigate the push factors. But then we also have to be prepared to put adequate resources on the border, and that means technology as well as people, in order to detect those who are coming in without authority. Are you optimistic that that's going to happen, that um, will somehow uh, slow that flow um, if we put those those uh, factors in place? I think this is going to be a, a not an overnight process. Part of what we need to do is to more rapidly adjudicate 
asylum applicants that have come to present themselves at the border. And when people have a legitimate asylum claim, we should admit them. And when they don't, we should return them. So really time is of the essence. But more generally, the messaging has to be that while we will welcome refugees and people who come with appropriate authority, it is not open borders. And I think balancing that and getting that message out is going to take a little bit of time. Some counterterrorism experts are saying that the end of the war in Afghanistan could inspire jihadist sympathizers here in the U.S. to attack. What do you think of that and how do you think that should be managed? Well, I think that's certainly a possibility. Um, it's not quite clear exactly what the situation on the ground in Afghanistan will be over the next few months. Uh, there may be a resurgence of groups like Al Qaeda. On the other hand, you have ISIS, which is actually in conflict with the Taliban. Um, and there will certainly be some people in the U.S. who may think this is uh, a positive sign in terms of being uh, global jihadis. So I think we've got to continue to use the tools and intelligence collection capabilities that have been successful in reducing attacks over the last years um, and be tuned in for the possibility of an increase in some of this activity. So when you were secretary, you mainly focused on foreign threats coming into the country or those inspired by foreign actors. Since then, we've seen the rise of uh, violent white nationalism. We saw the insurrection at the Capitol. What's going on? What brought this on? Well, I mean, there are some probably deeper global social uh, effects that have caused the rise of violent right-wing extremism. But there's no question that, as the FBI director said recently, that this is now the most significant terrorist threat in the U.S. that we face. And it doesn't show a sign of abating. The climax, of course, was January 6th, when we had an attempted insurrection here in Washington. Uh, the good news is now there's been uh, an enhancement of our security coordination in the district, but we're also going to have to be more energetic in watching what's going on online and publicly in terms of groups that are recruiting and even announcing their efforts to commit acts of terror against our government. So what's the most effective way to counter that threat? Well, one of the remarkable things <clears throat> is that, in fact, many of these extremist groups are not particularly secretive, and they go online or they go on social media platforms and advertise what they're going to do. And that makes information collection easier. But we also need to invest not only in law enforcement, but in efforts to de-radicalize some of the people who are being recruited by these right-wing groups. In the same way that we've <clears throat> tried to de-radicalize some people that have been recruited by jihadis. And this is going to require community involvement, as well as participation by the educational establishment and by social services. You know, regarding that uh, risk of uh, domestic violent extremism, current Secretary Mayorkas has said this, quote, I think that local communities are the most effective mechanism to address the domestic threat. You agree with that? I definitely agree, and I think what Secretary Mayorkas recognizes is that this is not um, necessarily a hierarchical effort by uh, right-wing extremists, but a lot of it occurs locally. The people who have the most visibility into what's going on are local officials and community leaders, and in fact, <clears throat> those people are in some ways best situated to have the credibility to begin to get some of the potential recruits to reverse the direction of their behavior. You know, all the, the violent white nationalist extremists are American citizens, by and large. So how does countering that um, affect the DHS response, given their constitutional rights? Well, I mean, I think you're exactly right. I mean, when we were dealing with overseas international terrorists, we had a relatively free hand in collecting information and intelligence. Here at home, the Constitution uh, and, and the law put some s significant limits on the ability to do the same kind of intelligence collection. But we do have the ability, where appropriate, to get warrants for surveillance. Also, where people are engaged in public behavior, that is visible, and you don't need to worry about you know, collecting that information. But again, this is why coming back to communities
matters because often the people with the best insight into emerging threats will be relatives, friends, and community leaders. I, I want to ask you about the Afghan evacuees. How can DHS properly vet them now that they're being resettled here in America? Well, this is a, a challenge maybe because obviously our, our access to some of the records in Afghanistan has been cut off by the fact that the Taliban now control the government. I do know Secretary Mayorkas is very focused on this. We are processing a lot of these people overseas uh, before they come to the U.S. And we do have tools that allow us to assess whether people are telling the truth or whether they are a threat. But there's no question we're going to have to be as careful as we can in making sure that these incoming refugees don't include a couple of people who are planning to do some bad things. You know, given the uh, evolving nature of threats facing the homeland, do you think DHS is structured and organized in the best way possible? Well, I think they've made some improvements over the last few years, which I think are helpful. For example, in the cyber area, I'm moving to what they call CISA, which is Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, has allowed DHS to be more operational in working with other agencies and the private sector in building capabilities to fight cyber attacks. So I think that's all positive. Getting a unity of effort where you get all the components to work together is always something that has been a bit of a challenge. But I know Secretary Mayorkas has experience with that because he was in part of the process back when the Obama administration was working hard to do that. You know, finally, um, Mr. Secretary, I just want to ask you about what are the other threats that we haven't talked about? What are, what are the threats that are emerging that we should be watching? Well, one is a, a consequence of, of the pandemic. Um, I think now we really have to examine where there have been deficiencies in our public health response to a major epidemic and start to correct that because I'm afraid this is not going to be the last pandemic we see. And then climate change has created issues with respect to uh, resilience, with respect to how we build in areas that are at risk, either for fires or for uh, hurricanes. And I think that's going to become an increasing part of DHS's mission through FEMA. Well, Mr. Secretary, so nice talking to you, and I hope that you'll come by and see us another time. I'll be happy to, and you stay well.